but I learned it because I was at Apple. Uh, so I joined Apple in 1986, um, fresh out of uni. Um, I actually started as a software tester, uh, testing development tools. My area of computer science was uh, systems and languages, so compilers, programming languages, operating systems and such. Got hired working on um, testing the uh, Pascal and C compilers. Um, and then I started writing these, uh, these reports about the, the uh, systems and um, product management people started reading them and they started coming by and talking to me and saying, hey, it's kind of an interesting insight you had there. And uh, oh, could you deliver that and develop that for us? And about four months in they said, hey, would you like to come be an associate product manager? I had no idea what a product manager was at that time. Um, you know, I was, I was a nerd, a techie. So I kind of did a little research and I said, yeah, that kind of sounds interesting. Help to make these products better uh, for people and such. And thus started my uh, career in product management. Um, during my tenure at Apple, I was involved in a combination of areas. One, technical product management, developer tools. Um, developer evangelism, which is really helping developers see how they can take advantage of a platform and helping to guide them, which is kind of an adjunct to product management. And I even did this little tiny, tiny, tiny um, piece of time in sales, which was really fun. If you've never done sales, you've got to do it. You cannot call yourself a product manager unless you've gone out and done some sales. It's just, I'm sorry for people, okay? Now, I got the chance to work on some really, really cool projects. The first project was Power Macintosh. I don't know if you know, but Apple originally built the Macintosh on the Motorola 68K processor, microprocessor. And the reality was, in the early 90s, we realized it wasn't, it wasn't going to take us forward. It wasn't, Motorola wasn't taking it, worked to make it the kind of platform we needed. And so this big deal happened with Motorola, Apple, and IBM to make something called the PowerPC, which is based off of the IBM Power Architecture. So we were asked, okay, well, you know, guys, you've got to change the processor. Um, do you know how difficult it is to change your underlying microprocessor in a system? <laughs> it's like taking the engine out of your car while it's going down the freeway and rebuilding it and reinserting it. But we did it. I was part of a team of five product managers that drove this project. People I will remember to this day, you know, Jim Gable, Pierre Cesarini, Denise Prashir, uh, myself, and then there was our program manager, Sheila Brady, who was just an awesome person. And you know, we even got our pictures in Business Week. It was really cool. I couldn't find that picture. I wouldn't give you that picture. <laughs> but it was an incredible project. Now, as part of that, I was able to evangelize a company called MetroWorks. MetroWorks did development tools. Apple had its bet for development tools for Power of Macintosh and for the Power PC. It was a deal with a company called Symantec, which you've probably heard of. It was a very big deal, multi-million dollar deal. And the fact was, Symantec wasn't delivered. I stumbled, literally, and this is how a lot of things happen in this, in this world. You stumble on things. I stumbled on this company that was making educational development tools in Montreal, Canada, all places, um, on the Macintosh to teach people how to program in Pascal and C. And we got started on talking about the problems with Power Macintosh and the need for a native development environment and all of that. And they're like, yeah, we want to be there. We want to do that. And they're like, okay. So I started basically feeding them hardware. Um, oh, you mean that machine? You didn't go to those people? Oh, I'm sorry. You know, at one point I was told to quit supporting them where I'd be fired. If that VP got fired. I was still there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and everything. It was a wonderful time. I mean, it was hard, it was wonderful, but really, up through 1994, when we did the Power Macintosh, things were really, really great now. Now, there were a lot of things that I retrospect see that were forerunners of what was going to happen next, which was <coughs> Business Week, February 1996, runs a cover story, the fall of the American icon. Um, you know, it was really hard to, uh, to see this, you know, you know, you, you walk home, pull this out of your mailbox, remember when we got magazines in the mail, um, and look at it and go, oh my god, that's where I work, you know, <laughs> and then read the article. Um, couldn't find the cover of it, but a few weeks later there was actually a cover story in Rolling Stone, two part, which I got quoted in, which really gets you creed with your kids when you can tell them you were in Rolling Stone. <laughs> but this was a serious thing. Um, and the reason this was happening is related to what I'm going to tell you the most important lesson from Steve Jobs. 
20 December 1996, Apple acquires Next. So Apple bought Next. Um, there had been two companies it was looking at, B, which was formed by a former um, Apple exec, Jean-Louis Gasset, and Next. The decision was made to go with Next, um, not to go with Plan B, um, but Plan A. Um, and this literally was unfolding in the week before this. This is right before we go on for the year end to the shutdown. Things were going right up to the line. Um, I was representing, remember that company I talked about back here, MetroWorks? Well, we, we, they were going to be key as part of this strategy. Um, so I'm working with them, and I'm working with people from corporate investments and strategic, the strategic alliances team and everything. And they're all like, hey, you know, this isn't going to happen, Jordan. We're all leaving. So they left at about 4 p.m., 5 p.m., the Friday before the Christmas break. Kind of makes sense. But I'm like, no, I think this is going to happen. So I'm just there hanging out, uh, making sure I have my people ready and everything. About 7.30, we get word. It's done. We all go into what's called the town hall um, at Apple. <clears throat> and you see Jobs is there, along with his portrait of, of, of next people. And I mean, it's just like, this is the guy. He left the year before I joined Apple, but we all knew about him. We all had heard Steve's story, and here was Steve, you know, and the deal was going down. Now, here's the interesting backstory. I had gotten married in September of 1996. Um, we were totally under a oath of secrecy. So I called my new wife up at that point and said, hi, yeah, I'm not coming home tonight. I don't know when I'm coming home tonight. Well, I can't tell you why. <laughs> No, really, I can't tell you why. <laughs> okay, tell you what. We'll watch the 11 o'clock news and you'll understand. I get home at 10.55, go in, turn the TV on, say, sit down. And of course, they do the promo, you know, right before the newscast comes on. And she goes, she looks at me, she goes, okay, I understand. You're forgiven. <laughs> okay? Now, as I think you all know, Steve came back, but Steve didn't take control at that point. Gil Emilio was still the CEO. Or because he thought he was. Um, <laughs> and, but over the next few months, Steve's influence grew and grew. And the board of directors really came to the conclusion, which I, I share, that Gil Emilio was really, really lost. He was out of his weight. He was an excellent, excellent CEO for National Semiconductor, but he was not the person for this. Um, his solution to any problem he saw was throw another product at it. And so there was an incredible blossoming of the product line. We had 57 Macintosh SKUs. I'm not talking about variations within product lines like RAM and disk space. I'm talking about the base configuration, 57. OK? Steve takes control that summer. And shortly after that, things start happening. Things start getting changed. Things start getting cut. And there's a big communication meeting. And a um, person I knew, a really good friend of mine, who was over in the competitive analysis group, Fidelia Kwok, gets up and she asks a question. And Steve already knew her. Yes, Fidelia, what is it? And she's like, you know, da 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 He says, listen, I need you to understand something. Success is about focus. Focus is about discipline. Discipline is about saying no. Success is about focus. Focus is about discipline. Discipline is about saying no. Now, I'm going to go and talk about all the different Apple things in a second, but I want to drive this home in a non-Apple, non-tech context. I do triathlons. I train a lot to do that. To be successful means I've got to be focused on that. I've got to be disciplined about that. Which means there's a lot of things I say no to. Like anything after basically 10 p.m. at night, I say no to. <laughs> I mean, I, I go to this wonderful poker game. I love the people I play poker. But they're used to it. OK, yeah, it's 10. Jordan's got to be. It's going to turn to a pumpkin. I, I'm not even sitting real loud. I don't even get midnight. I get 10 p.m. <laughs> so that I can do that. But that's my personal story. But let's talk about what this meant for Apple. 57 Macintosh SKUs. No. Boom. Okay? Instead, what you get 
is good, better, best. You get the iMac. Oh, the iMac. The iMac that didn't have a serial port that was going to kill the product because it was going to force people to use USB. That's an example of discipline. That's an example of saying no. Reduce the cost of the thing, and it drove a revolution in USB peripherals. How many of you have USB peripherals at home? You all do. Come on. <laughs> Should you see every hand up, okay? Reality is you do. That wouldn't have happened if Steve hadn't said no to a serial form. Okay? The whole idea of the good, better, best constellation. 57 products shrunk down to nine products. There were three, basically one base product in each area and three variants of that. You had the iMac, which was the prosumer product. You had the Macintosh Tower, which was the professional version. And you had the MacBook, or the PowerBook at that point, because it still had Power Macintosh inside it, that was there. That, and then there were three variants of it. Good, better, best. Okay? Simplicity. But you had to say no to a whole bunch of things. Oh, that special model that education wanted. Sorry, no, gone. Okay? It was there. Some other things were casualties along the way. Ever heard of the Newton message pad? Okay, I know that it's a subject of a lot of ridicule. Gary Trudeau, James Barry, loves to, 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 to mock it. He did a very good job of mocking it. But the fact of the matter, it was incredible technology. And the fact of the matter was, that summer of 1996, Negotiations were underway to spin Newton out and sell it. Would have brought money to Apple. Would have increased the war chest that we got from the Microsoft infusion, okay? For the settlement of the lawsuit. But Steve said no. Why? Because there were five engineers that would have gone with Newton that he felt he couldn't lose. Oh, another thing got killed, the email. We were set up for a fall sale season around this product, the email, for education. Fantastic product. And here's a little story a lot of people don't know. He also basically said no to this baby. Because Paul Mercer, who later founded Pixio, go look this up, good friend of mine, had already done this product. He'd already done it. But it wasn't time wasn't about the focus at this time. We'll come back around to how the iPod happens. But he said no to that at that point. He understood what he was saying no to. There's a great video of the Worldwide Developer Conference after all of this goes down. And after all these projects, this incredible bloodletting is going on. And there's this developer, this developer basically hammering Steve. And how Steve handles that is incredible. If you want to be a product manager, watch that video. Steve Jobs, WWDC, 1996, I think it is. Okay? We're white developers. But then he went and said yes to this. He said, yes, let's make this happen. Let's make Mac OS 9 happen. Now, we had basically been saying, oh yeah, we got this thing Copeland coming, or oh now we got this next stuff coming. You know, let's we'll just focus on that. And Steve said, no. I deliver now. Focus on this. We're saying no to those features right now. A couple other things he said. Um, you know how Apple's now really big in consumer electronics? This isn't actually anything new. Does anybody know what this is? This is the Apple Bondi Pippin. It's a game console. It's a game console that basically matched the specs of the Xbox in 1996, the first generation Xbox. No, not going to do it. Oh. Here's another one that got, that got. This is a tablet, Macintosh. Um, it was stylus with a CD-ROM. Showed this to people in, yeah, I know, CD-ROMs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, I did floppy disks, okay? <laughs> Mock me if you must. Um, but, I said, no, I'm not going to do it. Education loved this when they saw it. He loved it. It was fantastic. They were all over it. It was bloody. It was like 10 no's to one yes. 
which I think was probably closer to like a hundred pounds. But it was needed because there was so much that was going on that wasn't working, that wasn't fitting together. And what Jeeves said was, okay, success is about focus. We need to focus. That means we've got to be disciplined. That means we've got to say no. And that means that we're going to have to, as he put it, which you see if you we're just going to have to kill some of our children, okay? <laughs> and that's what it was. It was very bloody. It was hard. I saw people come out of movies where they made the best case for something they put five years of their lives into and just come out in tears. This is not easy. This is not simple. People are affected by this. But it's what, it's how this stuff happens. Saying no enables. It enables focus. Talk about that. Focus, discipline by saying no. All familiar with the concept of flow, right? And getting into the flow. Saying no means that you can focus, which means you can get into the flow. Which means you can get shit done. Okay? That's the reality. You know, when I go, you know, part of my job is, is I do is like senior leadership in engineering. Part of my job is to be, well, sometimes I call it the shit umbrella. Um, sometimes I call it the, the interrupt central. You know, I don't get anything done during the day. That's the reality. I get nothing done. If I stay up on my email and my instant message, I consider it a successful day. I do the stuff that really matters, my thinking and everything. That's why I'm out doing a 2,000 meter swim, or 120K bike ride, or 21K run. That's when I do that. Because I'm able to do that kind of thinking and come back. It was interesting. I was talking to a boss once, and he's like, yeah, you ran over this, didn't you? I'm like, yeah. He says, you haven't run on this yet, have you? He was like, I was putting together something. And I'm like, yeah, how did you know? And he says, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is raw. It hasn't been processed. You know, and he literally said, OK, what do you have on your training schedule today? I said, oh, it was fun to do a 2,000 meter swim. He says, why don't you go do it, come back, and, and rework this? And I did. And it worked. <laughs> but he understood how I worked. But that, that focus, that flow, that success, it comes from saying no. <clears throat> you are going to have customers come to you who are going to tell you that they want features. You need to figure out which ones you're going to do and which ones you're not going to do. I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm not telling you what system to use. But probably something about customer value and ability to open new markets might be a useful criteria to do it on. Um, we can talk about that in a different talk. But you need to be able to do that. If you are saying no 10 times for every time you say yes, then you're on a path to success. If you're saying yes 10 times for every no, you are on a path to failure. You will be Apple in 19. 96, Business Week cover, February 5th. That's the reality. Now, let's talk about some of the successes that came out of this and see how they played out. 2001, Mac OS X launches. You know what? There was a lot of things in that initial product that we said no to, but we got it out the door. Now, at this point, I've made the transition, and I'm no longer at Apple. I'm actually at Adobe Systems. And in Adobe Systems, I'm running the program to make sure we adopt Mac OS X. So I see this from both sides of the street. And the fact was, there were a lot of things we wanted. And we kept going down, oh, we need this, we need this, we need this. And I kept hearing, no, 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 no. But at the end of the day, those decisions allowed them to get a product out, they could get into the market, that people could use, and they could get feedback on, and it was good enough. Oh, here's another one. I bought the original one. So here's the story. Paul Mercer, who um, well, actually never graduated from college, <coughs> joined Apple. I met him. If you ever want to check out, there's a conference called MacHack. It doesn't exist anymore, but MacHack. And you can Google MacHack uh, plus Jordan. Um, and you should have some fun and have some chuckles there. It, yes, it is all my fault. Um, so Paul. Um, had been doing very interesting things, came out of uni, left school, joined Apple, um, started hacking on things, was part of a team that helped make Mac OS 7 happen and Mac OS 8 happen, and then started looking at this whole area of like,